welcome everyone. And um, what we're gonna do here is we'll start with some judge introductions. So we'll go around and so you kind of get a feel for who we all are here today. Um, I've been very impressed. We've had some very impressive judges. So it's really a, a nice opportunity to have um, everyone with us here today. Uh, and then I will give some opening comments just to kind of get us ready. And then I will turn it over to you all uh, for your presentation. Uh, I will also be the uh, time checker. So uh, once uh, I hand it off to you and you get started, I will start your, your timer going there um, and make sure that we kind of stay on track. Uh, but we have plenty of time, so um, nothing, nothing to worry about. Um, so with that, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I am the uh, Senior Ethics Director for uh, Raytheon's, uh, Raytheon Technologies Intelligence and Space uh, Business. So uh, this is an aerospace and defense company and uh, my business unit in particular that I'm the head ethics person for, um, we have around 37,000 employees spread around the world. So um, pretty large organization, obviously, then when you, you add in the other business units, it's a pretty big company. Um, so my background, I've, I've spent my career actually at Raytheon. Uh, so when I graduated from college, I took a job uh, as a, um, a contracts employee, uh, managing government contracts with the US government and um, international customers. And, um, and then after spending several years doing that, um, I moved into the ethics office back in 2012. So yeah, 10 years ago and, um, and have kind of been in this role ever since. So um, I, I work out of, um, well, I work out of my house now, but, but I live in Los Angeles, California. And um, I'm happy to be here, as I said. So uh, with that, uh, Valerie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Valerie Jones Felix and I am an LMU alum. I currently uh, teach business entrepreneurship at the secondary level. Uh, I was a student in the College of Business and in my uh, business entrepreneurship class, we focus on social entrepreneurship. And I'm very uh, excited to be participating. This is my first time. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the presentation today. Great. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, Rochelle. Yeah, found the onion button. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I am Rochelle Ferris. I um, am also an alum of LMU, probably before Valerie. I think I was in like the second MBA class that graduated from there. <laughs> um, I retired from the software industry, worked for large vendors like Oracle, SAP, and PeopleSoft. Um, I retired and now I'm actually a chaplain um, for a local hospital. Great, thank you, Rochelle. Um, Peter, how about you? Thank you. Um, well, just a, a quick note about myself, uh, Peter Walner. Um, I am also an alumni from Loyola Marymount, um, undergraduate. I was a business major, international business emphasis, spent a few years outside of the country, Germany specifically, uh, working, and then uh, came back here to Los Angeles, started a brokerage, real estate brokerage, specializing in land acquisition, new home development, and um, we do have a lot of uh, ethics in certain areas that we have to cover on a daily basis. So uh, I'm very excited about this opportunity. I am a first time judge as well. And uh, judging from what I've read so far, I'm very excited to be part of this program. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Peter. Okay, so unless I'm missing anyone, I think those are all of our judges. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. So. In this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, 
teams will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 10 to 15 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and judges stay in character. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside the role playing. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go on mute and turn it over to you all and you can start whenever you're ready. All right, thank you so much. Danielle, would you be able to share our project proposal? Okay, does everybody see that? Yeah, okay. All right. Hello, we are Tethys Consulting Firm, and we come today with a proposal to Nestle with the Infinity Hydro Panel, a hydro panel that desalinates water for mass agricultural use. I am CEO Lauren Colasso. I am CFO Rohan Tharani. I'm COO Jack Brixius. And I'm CLO Danielle Ojeda. Our sustainability goal and mission is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water for all. We never know the worth of water till the entire well is dry. In terms of key identified problems for Nestle and solutions that the Infinity Hydro Panel provides, we are here specifically proposing to Nestle because Nestle has a monopoly of numerous branches of water brands. From, from A through Z, it all falls under Nestle's domain. In the past, Nestle has come under fire for pulling fresh water from third world nations. This has created a growing distrust from its consumers. From the sustainability perspective, which I will soon dive into, fresh water is projected to become scarce by the year 2050. And there are already a multitude of nations that do not have access to clean fresh water already. The solution we're providing allows Nestle to extract water from international zones that are far less contentious than specific nations but protected by international treaties, and it taps into the Earth's largest untapped water potential and provides economic viability for 705 million gallons of water that Nestle uses per year. So let's dive into the sustainability aspect, shall we? Because sustainability is so deeply entrenched with financial, legal, and business and ethical sides of any system. Water is one of Earth's most precious resources. And while we may not think of it as a limited resource, the UN predicts that at the current rate of use, we will run out of fresh water by the year 2050. With the global impending climate crisis on the horizon, it is paramount we put forth technology that aims to mitigate this crisis before it is too late. Our current rate of water consumption is not sustainable, especially at the rate humanity uses water. And yes, we use water, whether it's consuming animal products, plant products, agriculture, horticulture, washing, drinking, we need water in our day-to-day -day lives. We, as the producers, consumers, or sellers of water, put in the effort that we can to curb our usage, but at the rate of humanity's usage, it is not enough. In terms of specific sectors of water use, 70% of all fresh water is used for agricultural and horticultural use. This is over two quadrillion gallons of water. The annual census of agriculture only predicts a rise in the amount of water being used in the coming years. So we are proposing an innovative solution to this unique problem. Oceans hold 96.5% of all of Earth's water. 96. 0.5% of all of Earth's water. That is boundless untapped potential. Some might even say infinite. We are proposing the Infinity Hydro Panel, a hydro panel that utilizes energy from the sun to desalinate ocean water. We have an exclusivity agreement for the hydro panel from WaterFX, a Californian company dedicated to sustainable clean water solutions. And the hydro panel itself is made of a series of silicon semiconductors and a hygroscopic funnel to bring water in. From products that have completed experimental versions of this, such as the source hydro panel, which dispenses clean and mineralized water taken from the atmosphere, we, this proves that we can use solar energy to create clean, pollutant-free drinking water. So in theory, we can utilize our infinity hydro panel to mass desalinate water for agricultural purposes. In theory, every hydro panel system can desalinate up to 40,000 gallons of oceanic water per day. Water that was completely unusable from a consumer standpoint can now become a potential source of clean water for all. So Nestle has reported by, that by the year 2030, they have the ambition to strive for zero environmental impacts in their operations, and by 2050, to achieve zero net greenhouse gas emissions. Let's talk about how we can get there. 
Looking into Nestle's key policies, the adopting of the Infinity Hydro Panel allows for regenerative agriculture and water supply. Oceanic sources for water greatly cuts down on undue water extractions in nations of the world where it may cause environmental catastrophe, as it has in the past from the Six Nations Treaty land and draining from river watersheds. This blends both into the ethical and sustainable concepts of water usage. Additionally, the Infinity Hydro Panel is powered by solar energy. This has the potential to uniquely desalinate water using an electrochemical gradient, which reduces Nestle's carbon footprint. Nestle currently has an output of 92 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions, 72% of which come from sourcing the growth of their agricultural and water products. The potential of this product to revolutionize the company and the way we envision the future of environmentally friendly technology is completely unmatched. Now, our chief legal officer will break down the law aspects of our Infinity Hydro Panel. Thank you, Lauren. Well, th there are several boundaries which guide water extraction worldwide. While Nestle is a Swiss company, much of its extraction actually comes from North America, which is why we'll be going into US and Canadian law specifically. When we think of US law with water, we think of the Clean Water Act. But this act actually doesn't govern contamination for water. It, it, it actually governs contamination for water, not water extraction. This is left up to state law, such as the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is setting up a 2040 target date for groundwater sustainability. This is a state that is suffering from severe water scarcity that is adversely affecting its communities. In Maine, the Maine Water Extraction Tax sets up a tax for 1.5 million of gallons of water of groundwater or surface water extracted. This isn't strictly prohibiting extraction, but it has financial repercussions for Nestle when it's over extracted. Besides this, there are state permit requirements for every state and the, the renewal of these state permit requirement of these state permits actually take a long time. Once these state permits actually expire, they're said to be Nestle is said to be not permitted in that area, which is causing actually reputational issues uh, among its customers. In Canadian law, this the the federal law is actually not governing in the same way as U.S. law governs, uh, does not govern water extraction. This is left up to provinces, such as in Ontario, the Water Resources Act, which cover, covers groundwater licensing and requires use reports. This is also causing uh, nasty problems, as we'll see on the legal side of things, um, which we'll discuss further. Uh, the in international law doesn't actually set up also prohibitions, but there is a standard that Nestle has to reach. The protocol on water and Water and Health, which was set up during the 1992 Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Boundary Water Courses and International Lakes, sets up a standard for better water management and for the, the solution to water-related diseases. Now that we've discussed the legal areas that govern water extraction, we can discuss where Nestle is currently overstepping its boundaries. Michigan Citizens for Water Conservation v. Nestle Waters North America, Inc. is the case in 2005 with this as I mentioned, a nonprofit grassroots organization claiming that there's a violation of the Michigan Environmental Protection Act. Nextly actually lost this case due to a, um, due to a result that said that its extraction of 400 gallons per minute of water is overstepping its boundaries because it's not needed to keep the business afloat. It's actually only used, it's actually only covering profit, profit that is unnecessary for Nestle, such a big company. In Toronto, the native population was suffering in 2018, which 63,000 of its people in the Six Nations, which actually in perspective relates to about nearly half of the population of Kansas City, do not have drinkable water for a year, while Nestle extracted up to 3.6 million liters of water daily. Now I ask you, how does it make sense for people not to have access to their own drinkable water? They're being sold their own water by Nestle, are not allowed to set up their own water contamination, water treatment, and extraction systems. In Poland Spring, Maine, there was a different issue in 2019 with the marketing of 100% natural spring water. Here, the plaintiffs claim that the water extracted by Nestle was actually regular groundwater. There are regulations governing how spring water can be marketed and requirements. They said that Poland Spring actually dried up 50 years ago. In California, there was direct state intervention. As we stated, there is a water scarcity problem. This is only going to happen further and, and continue in other states as we reach that 2050 date. That Lauren mentioned. There was a cease and desist order in response to the over extraction of 25% in Strawberry Creek. We're presenting to you the legal and sustainable alternative. Desalination through our infinity hydro panels adds water to our current supply, which should already be available to residents. 
While Nestle has claimed that it has it will not stop its extraction due to water being extracted anyways and being a basic right for everyone, it is a basic right. But bottled water is for convenience. That is what Nestle is selling. They're not, they're selling water that should already be available. And our solution would actually eliminate the water inequity issues that are seen in the Six Nations by providing that, providing extra water as Nestle is trying to do and provide the convenience of bottled water while also maintaining and allowing for these uh, water reservoirs to uh, replenish. In addition to this, there would also be avoiding marketing issues as seen with Poland Spring and the requirements. In Michigan, they were trying to access the Sanctuary Springs, which is what led to that case that I mentioned before, because it's more marketable. We understand that spring water is seen as more clean. It's, it's worth your money. But however, using our sustainable alternative, you can customers can trust that it's ethically sourced, that it has the right blend of pH and, and perfect minerals, and they will buy the water just because it's already the perfect blend without having to go through the struggles of getting permits for the sanctuary springs or such uh, that people are protesting. We ask that Nestle lead the industry the right way. There aren't currently strict laws regarding desalination because it's such new technology. But by setting up, by being taking the first step towards desalination, they're setting up a trend for positive legal responses in the future because they're doing it the right way. California's 2015 Ocean Plan desalination amendment actually already regulates disposal and intake methods since the state is already looking into new technologies. They're a little more advanced than this. The hydro panel actually already takes into account uh, these problems given a deeper intake, which actually preserves biodiversity. And by disposing of the salt brine water, it, by using it in chemical products, they're not dumping it back into the ocean where uh, salt water will be more concentrated, not good for the organisms living in the ocean. If Nessie continues with its current processes, they're only going to face further legal backlash and financial issues due to lawsuits that I mentioned before. We're already reaching that 2050 target date. As water scarcity continues, we don't know if companies will be allowed to extract this much or if we're just gonna have to use the water in our systems just for people. Uh, besides this, we're already seeing expired permits in the San, San Bernardino National Forest. People are protesting that Nestle has no right to be in there. Even if they got government approval, it already messes up their reputation due to an expiration of permits that they're not able to renew for years. And we're not asking to do for Nestle to do anything new per se. Nestle's five commitments on water stewardship have already shown the world that they're capable of caring about people's rights to water. Their progress had marked in the Nestle and Society report, and uh, using this new innovation and these new technologies will look seller on their society reports and show their customers that they're making considerable progress. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Rohan for finances, our CFO. Thank you, Daniel. So in order to understand the finances and how cost effective the hydro panel implementation be, we should look at a few, a few key facts about Nestle as of today. Nestle's market cap in April of this month, I mean, of this year, has been about 360 billion US dollars. This is the largest market capitalization amongst consumer packaged goods companies. Therefore, we do think that this opens up a huge opportunity for Nestle for reinvestment of profit and revenue towards more sustainable sources of water extraction. Going on, another interesting fact that I found, we found in the finances section is that Nestle only comprises um, Nestle sells water across the entire world and all kinds of products across the entire world, but the United States is the largest uh, purchaser for Nestle's products, including water and other products as well. On the next slide, you will see a few charts that show how revenue is broken up and how water is utilized for what products. America accounts at 45% of Nestle's sales followed by Europe at 29% and followed by the rest of the world at 26%. Just to put it in perspective, the United States of America has 4.25% of global population and yet consumes so much water and so many products of Nestle. And another, another interesting fact that this chart will show you is Nestle's revenues com com comprise of beverages, nutrition and health science, pet care, as well as water yet only a relatively small amount of water extracted by Nestle is used towards bottled water, and bottled water only accounts for 8% of Nestle's total revenue. In the SWOT analysis on the following slide, you will see that a recurring theme 
in the weaknesses and threats section of Nestle includes water extraction. This is a problem that's only expected, expected to get worse in the future due to increased increase global consumption and population. Nestle, however, does invest heavily in research and development, and Nestle is trying to make environmentally safe methods and practice those in implementation. As Laura mentioned, Nestle has goals for environmentally safe and sustainable methods of extraction and production on 2030 and 2050 respectively, which is why we chose to present the hydro panel as a cost-effective source of water extraction and conversion. Therefore, the hydro panel is something that can help with that. It will also reduce the amount of money that Nestle spends on lawsuits every single year, spent, uh, saving tens of millions of dollars on those expenses by itself. In the cost, cost and ben benefits section in the next slide, we do see how the hydro panel is gonna benefit not only Nestle, but the general population of the world as well as its consumers. The biggest fact about the hydro panel is that it will, the, it will be using a source of water that replenishes itself, ocean water. Ocean water does replenish itself every single year through, through environmental processes. Therefore, it's a supply that will last long into the future and not run out for at least the foreseeable future. This will benefit the people that live near, near aquifers, near farms, and near potential sites and current sites for water extraction by Nestle. These people will be spared health, health problems and they will have control over, over the water once again to use it for whatever purpose they see fit, thereby increasing consumer welfare. The cost for a hydro panel system is about $5,500 to $6,500, and it is capable of producing 40,000 gallons of water a day. Compare that to about 700 million to 1 billion gallons of water extracted by Nestle annually, and you will see how a cost effective solution like this can reset the entire infrastructure of Nestle in the short term as well as the long term. We do, however, recommend a short term adoption of the hydro panel at first because Nestle is a big company. And adopting a revolutionary, a revolutionary technology like the hydro panel will definitely serve to cause uh, production delays, and it might also hurt the company financially as well as operationally. Nestle has a huge infrastructure worldwide for water extraction and transport. Therefore, we do suggest a short-term implementation in few select countries that are greatly affected by Nestle's current methods of water extraction, and then move on to larger markets like the United States and Europe. I'm gonna hand it off to, uh, to Jack, our ethics officer. Thank you, Rohan. Okay, so we are using a utilitarian framework, which considers something good if it benefits the majority of people. So for an action to be good, it must bring about the greatest benefit to the greatest number of individuals. So um, you can go ahead and move to, uh, just to contextualize this a little bit, the, the water crisis context is really important to kind of consider. Here is Nestle's conundrum right now. Current methods of water extraction have an unintended consequence um, in that they harm people. But before I get into that, we need to acknowledge that Nestle's actions are part of a bigger ethical problem, which is the global water crisis. So this was mentioned earlier to talk about sustainability, but we're gonna be focusing on the moral and ethical obligations that this issue faces us with. So, the effects of water scarcity and poor sanitation caused by it are kind of sprawling. So exact numbers are really hard to collect, but according to UNICEF, about one in four do not have safely managed drinking water. The UN says that's about three in 10. And water.org also has more numbers. They say about 771 million people lack safe water and 1.7 billion suffer from the poor sanitation that results. So what does that actually look like? Well, around 673 million people defecate in public, according to the UN. And as if that wasn't bad enough, about every two minutes, a child actually dies from water-related disease. So um, what does any of this have anything to do with Nestle? Well, Nestle, albeit unwittingly, does contribute. Um, between 2018 and 2020, Nestle extracted around 173 million more gallons than it was permitted to. And well, what did that look like? Um, six, six Nations was mentioned earlier. 
And here's what happened to some people in that territory. A, a five-year-old boy had this rash that wouldn't go away that was caused by lack of water. And a mother of five had to hike with buckets just to collect water for her family because there was not enough nearby. And these are just two cases, but there are many others. It's not very localized, unfortunately. Um, however, I'll concede, although all of that may be sad, it doesn't answer the question, why should Nestle care? Because after all, Nestle only contributes to a small portion of water scarcity. And it's not the obligation of a profit-seeking firm to be charitable or altruistic. It's the obligation of that firm to make more money. So just because we praise the utilitarian framework does not mean you do or necessarily should. However, in this case, we hold that you should because if there is a way to alleviate human suffering to any degree, then it should absolutely be done. And it's a, uh, it's a moral and ethical obligation. Uh, many would say that causing so much as one person, any amount is suffering is grounds for radical change. So the UN would list water deprivation as a human rights violation. And what's more, slowly depleting the world's water supply or contributing to it in any way, and will eventually, uh, and does right now, threaten all of humanity. So this doomsday scenario seems impossible, but as was mentioned before, by 2050, scarcity will become a real issue. However, if you still ask why should Nestle help, there is a more compelling answer, which is because you can. So before, Nestle had to consider its beneficiaries before considering the well-being of people relying on the water it extracted, but now there's a way to benefit both. So if Nestle uses the Infinity Hydro Panel to extract water from an inexhaustible source, then ethical concerns will basically dissolve because by simply placing panels under the sun, water can be collected from previously untapped resources and Nestle could use that water for global distribution instead. So people would not suffer from lack of water because they could collect from natural well springs as they did before. And the environment would also thrive because its degradation would come to, to a halt effectively. So Nestle would still be able to meet any quantity of demand without depleting the environment or harming people physically. So previously ethical concerns were, were weak motivators because there's no practical solution to them. And now there is. And with it, Nestle has the power to save lives. Thank you. All right. In conclusion, even though Nestle is making important moves to making water accessible all over the world, these efforts are not nearly enough to account for the damage being done in other places during times of water scarcity. Implementing our proposal would mean opening up a new world of sustainably sourced products without having the issues of ambiguity or legal backlash or environmental costs. The long-term gains would greatly overpower any initial investment and provide a permanent solution to the water crisis that can be trusted as ethical and further your mission to provide water all across the globe. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let me stop my timer here. I apologize for the pop-in guest while you guys were talking, but she's gone now. Um, Okay, so uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so let me actually open it up to my fellow judges here. Um, I, I felt like last session I cut some people off. Um, so Rochelle, would you maybe like to get us started here? Okay. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I do have a question on, um, we've had a desalinization plant here in Southern California in Orange County for 20 years. I've, um, I'm trying to think who did the legal the legal dimension. Um, oh, I did. That was Danielle. Yeah. Danielle. So, um, and there, there, it's the legal dimension, but there's also some politics. So I was wondering if you did any research around that because it's been a very politically charged issue and it kind of goes in now. Right. But the difference between this hydro panel and desalination uh, desalination plans already established, which I think there are about 11 in California, there, uh, there's a proposal for 10 more. But the problem with these desalination plants is that they emit a lot of greenhouse gases. That is why they're not considered a sustainable approach in their thermal, they use a thermal method route at that uses greenhouse gases actually adding to fossil fuels. So it's not a sustainable approach. There should be a political issue over it because while you're fixing one issue, you're exacerbating another. Uh, this won't be a problem since we're using actually renewable sources. 
Uh, and actually, California, the reason that they had that 2015 amendment was because of water effects. This is a company based in California. They've actually made plans towards partnership with that and made research towards fixing these issues. So we don't foresee that there will be a problem because there won't be a, an environmental issue. That is a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, Valerie, do you have a, a question for the group? Yeah, I have a, a couple of, of questions. Just continuing uh, the question about the greenhouse gases. I believe there was a projection that uh, there's 9,200 uh, greenhouse gas exposure annually, and your goal is to get to zero by 2050. Uh, have you done any um, projections as to uh, the rate of decre decreasing those greenhouse glasses to get to 2050? There's about 20 years. So what is the, the reduction rate annually that you uh, have projected? And then also uh, the process of renewable energy, uh, what is the impact on the rate for water for people who are in those areas, are they going to see a significant increase due to the expense of, of starting this up in their in their water bill? I guess I'll take that again. But uh, the first question I think you asked about you cut off a little bit, but I think you're referring to the renewable energy and how that like studying how how that will be impacted. Um, since we're not dealing with uh, we're not dealing with the greenhouse gases directly, where I don't even think with with current water extraction, there really is a uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we, we didn't really study that because we won't be dealing with greenhouse gases. I made reference to that because in in other green in other desalination plants, they do use greenhouse gases. We won't be adding to that impact. Therefore, there's no uh, for say reduction because we haven't been using that. Uh, and Nestle hasn't been using that in terms of water extraction. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Lauren wants to answer the second half of that question. I can answer the second half of the question. So just to add on a little bit of what Danielle said, we won't be emitting any type of greenhouse gases due to us relying solely on the solar energy and then the electrochemical gradient to exchange ions in order to desalinate the water. And then in reference to asking about startup costs, every water panel system costs 5,500 to 6,500. And I understand that in order to implement many in place, it may be costly as the beginning venture. But as, as more and more communities are able able to get access to this water, or Nestle is able to extract water in a, in a cheap way, they're able to sell water for cheaper. They're able to sell their agricultural products for cheaper, overall making more sources of products for easier consumer buying. Uh, do, you, do you have as a goal to uh, have Nestle exclusively use desalination water and move away from competing with communities and agriculture for spring water? So as of now, we're, we're opening it up as a beginning venture, but we're hoping by the year 2050 that Nestle will be using exclusively these desalinating panels. Right now, this also works really well into, into Nestle's financial goals because there's currently a business energy and investment tax credit, which allows much of the percentage of installation costs to be covered by the state if they're using renewable energy. So it's very feasible for Nestle to get up and started to meet their 2030 goal of reduction and the 2050 goal of completely zeroing out at zero net greenhouse gas emissions. I also want to, I also wanted to add, uh, well, it's per state besides that business energy tax credit, North Carolina and states that are suffering from this shortage already have established tax credits. And like Lauren said, this is, and I think Rohan mentioned it, this is like a, a short term plan for now where it's a gradual process. You're not going to eliminate every water extraction plant that Nestle currently has. But we also hope not only for Nestle to implement this, but for other companies to follow lead because once Consumers see that Nestle is making these sustainable approaches, they will want to purchase from Nestle rather than other companies. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, do you have a question for the group? I hate to, to focus on the legal questions, but I, I, that, that is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. Um, 
So you talked a lot about some of the, the litigation and the, the, the court cases that have resulted from the approach that we've been taking so far in, in collecting water. Um, and then you say, okay, let's pivot to this different way of doing things because it's, it's all good. But I believe there was on one of your slides that kind of indicated that uh, there's not a lot of regulations or, or law mm -hmm. around this new technology yet. And so there's a part of me that's very concerned that if we pivot our business and we make this investment to change our approach before we really know kind of where the regulations are going to go, are we opening ourselves up to maybe even more legal risk or even the government saying, hey, you can't do that at some point. So I'm just wondering if we're maybe going too soon down this path before we know kind of how that's all gonna play out. Right, so Nessie is already overstepping its boundaries as we stated before. So legal backlash is not a new thing to them. This is actually an approach I think the government would actually want it to be taking considering it was the California state government that actually already intervened. Um, obviously, they would, they would need to consult on a state-to-state -state basis. This is something that should be implemented with government approval. This is not, and, and the reason I said that to leading litigation the right way is because once Nestle does it in partnership with the government, they're not already raising red flags, red flags that the government would raise for every company who is trying to do these desalination proposals. Um, I suggest that Nestle should do it just because there are there's litigation that concerns, like in California, these types of regulations that we foresee. We're already involved in the possible, in, with greenhouse gases, with the salt brine disposal, things like that. So we, we don't foresee that, ne that Nestle will have litigation issues as long as they consult with the government. They're already, the state permits that I mentioned are already expiring. As, as we go on through the years. And I imagine that they'll be granted even less uh, for state permits renewals with water extraction eventually. And so we can shift these state permits, yes, to coastal areas um, in other countries and within the United States, which is where they get most of their, their water. So as long as they are in partnership with the government, there should be no red flags raised. I'm going to ask a, a follow on or a different question, I guess, unless it, I'm going to give Peter another shot here. Um, does Peter want to possibly type this question? Okay, that's a good idea. Let's give him a minute here. I, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, perfect. I apologize for that, Megan. I, uh, one little button makes a difference, <laughs> as, as does one drop for the whole world, correct? <laughs> um, so I'm a real estate. I'm in, I'm in the real estate world. Um, so for me, I kind of wanted to focus one question on the cost of the financial side. Um, as, a, as a board member at Nestle, the uh, one area is uh, the desalination does need to go somewhere or need to be stored in some, I'm assuming in some, some capacity. Um, have you done any research on how much space or how much needs to be, how much land needs to be uh, acquired to be able to store the water and how long does the water um, potentially need to be stored before it's utilized. I'm sure that each, of course, each location, I'm in Southern California and land is at a premium, much like the water here in Southern California. But um, has there been any kind of, uh, have you looked into what types of um, storage facilities or capabilities you may have or may require us to have um, and maybe what some costs are associated to that? Just, just uh, kind of reaching out there from that perspective. Sure, uh, I'll be happy to take this question for you. Nestle already has an existing infrastructure for water extraction through several plants that are located throughout its, its you know, regions in the United States and across the world. These plants are operated by pipelines and tanks that already store the water and may refine it to remove any kind of pollutants that might be in those waters. So therefore, by implementing the hydro panel, near the ocean where obviously you're going to desalinate the water. It transports through pipelines to these plants where they are once again reviewed, um, not necessarily reviewed, that's the wrong word, but they are uh, tested for pollutants for any kind and for uh, whether or not they can, they are drinkable or not. Once that has been determined and it's a large supply of water, 40,000 gallons a day, these uh, the water will be stored in tanks and it will follow the existing schedule for Nestle to um, transport water from these plants via tankers uh, or pipelines to city infrastructure that already exists. 
the only thing the hydro plant would be doing in terms of water extraction is just changing the way water is collected and from where it's collected. The existing infrastructure of Nestle is responsible as it always has been to transport and refine the water and test it however they see fit. We did mention in the presentation that this is going to be starting off with a short, short term adoption only because it could come across a little costly, um, right, just for one system itself. And implementing a revolution technology like this into a, a the existing infrastructure that has existed for decades, just changing it overnight is not going to be financially well for the company, despite having a more cost effective solution of water extraction. It would hurt the company for the medium term. Therefore, we suggest that the existing methods of transportation of water from source to plant to consumer, the supply chain still will remain un uninterrupted. The only thing that would change is how it's supplied from the source. Therefore, yeah, that's the answer to your question, I believe. Uh, I like that when I when I can utilize my own resources and I don't have to build too many new items. So that, that does that answers my question well. Thank you so much. Of course. Okay, I'll open it up. Do any of the judges have a final question for the group? Yes, I do. I'll hear uh, you. My question has to do with uh, the environment. Uh, one of the ethical uh, concerns that you raise is least harm and for the most good. So has there been any studies uh, in regards to the impact on the ocean life uh, with the desalination uh, plant? Um, in terms of the ethics of the, of the maritime world, if you were to place a bunch of panels along the ocean and extract water from the ocean, the levels would would not change. Like they would, it would be inconsequential in terms of that. Also, I think in terms of uh, extracting from from like environments and using solar energy, it would take about seventy thousand hydro panels per person on the planet to actually alter the climate in any significant way. So um, you would need an incredible amount. I don't. I don't even know how much. How much service area that would cover 70,000 panels per person. Um, but it, it would take an astronomical number of hydro panels to actually significantly alter the, uh, the environment or, or ocean life in any way. Because all it's doing is just taking a little bit out and then purifying it and then sending it to the pre existing storage plants. So it, it would not um, affect ocean life in any way. I do have a follow up to that question, by the way. Um, uh, Nestle extracts in. Um about 700 million to a billion gallons of water per day. And compared to how 96.5% of Earth's water is in the oceans, that will leave about 3.5% that's actually being utilized on land or lakes like, or rivers, like groundwater, river water, or aquifers that already exist. You're ex extracting 700 million to a billion gallons of water from a source that is infinitely, well, not infinitely, but significantly less than what's actually out there but not necessarily edible yet. Therefore, it's not going to affect the environment in a very in an impactful way at all, almost at all. The only thing that may be affected, if anything, and that's a, this is a long shot, is while you're constructing the structures, the foundations to hold a hydro panel system. It's going to require some kind of digging, some kind of uh, mining along the coast at the very maximum. But it's sustainable enough. It's not going to affect the environment or marine life in any single way because all you have to do is just dip a certain pipeline into the ocean or a hydropower station and the suction will do the rest. So there's not, not going to be any environmental costs as Thank such as marine costs. Well, yeah. Also, in terms of sea life, which I think you mentioned marine life, this has been a problem that we address. And with the deeper intake, that's the whole reason because if not, it's taken in by the suction these uh, marine organisms. So it's very important to do this the right way, to have that deep extraction to not suck up any marine life with it. So those are the possible concerns that we've dealt with and thought about. Um, adding on to, adding on as a final part to our answer, um, sort of in reference to our one drop at a time, the amount of water we're extracting from the ocean in ratio to the entire ocean is but a single drop in the bucket. We can, when we're building pipelines, we thought about where we'll be building the pipelines within the ocean, how we'll be extracting it exactly. And then in comparison to where Nestle has been pulling their water from in the past, they've been pulling from those third world countries, they've been pulling from watersheds, causing this environmental catastrophe. So this 
comparatively is a far less contentious and a far safer for not only the marine wildlife, but for the people itself who depend on these water sources. Does that help answer your question? Absolutely. You've done a fantastic job of answering that question. Thank you all. Okay, so I think we're, we're, we're at time for our Q&A portion. I do, when you, when you started off with and you ended with the, uh, you never know the value of water until the well is dry. That's a, very, that's a great statement. It gives us the opportunity to really um, monetize what you're discussing and what you're putting together. And, and that creates, for me, it's a value add. I go into the financials, I look for those items. Um, but when uh, in the presentation, I believe you guys did very well from that perspective. You're able to, each one started um, started with and gave their definition of what, what they're going to be talking about and ended that way as well. So um, that for me was, uh, was very positive. So um, I wanted to just uh, congratulate you on that, that part of it. Um, the uh, one area that was a little, um, uh, it was a little hard to follow were some of the costs associated when we had the $5,500 to $6,500 unit to cost and 40,000 gallons, gallons per day. But the way that you guys brought it uh, full circle was um, there wasn't really going to be an environmental effect to uh, utilizing this because of the amount of hydro panels that would be required in order to, um, if it were to cause any kind of marine issues uh, or from the ocean perspective, you, um, you answered with, it would take an, almost an infinite amount of these panels to really cause some damage to the environment. So um, there's a little, little gray in that part, but uh, and you did answer the questions the way we wanted them. So I wanted to thank you for that part. I think that was my contribution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, Rochelle, how about you? Okay. <laughs> All right. Lauren, you are an amazing speaker. You have a gift for it. <laughs> so, thank you um, so much. But I wanted to tell you and Danielle something that I suffer from as, too, as well, especially when I'm nervous, is you talk really fast. <laughs> and sometimes I'm older and slow. So sometimes I missed some of what you said. Um, and then I thought, the transitions in your presentation were excellent. Um, the way you you know move through the through the subjects and then transition to each other. You, I can tell you guys practiced and did a great job. And finally, Rohan, um, as a former MBA student, I loved your SWOT analysis and cost benefit analysis. I think you organized you. your slides really well. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay. It means a lot. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Rochelle. Uh, Valerie, how about you? Yes, I'll just uh, add that the uh, the slides, all of the slides um, were uh, very easy enough to follow along with, uh, with your presentation. They presented information uh, so that I could clearly understand uh, the legal, the ethical, the financials around your uh, company. And, um, I like the diagrams, the graphics uh, that were embedded in your presentation because it helped me to really visualize the flow of the information that you were presenting. So I really appreciate the way you laid out each of your slides. Um, I under the the legal uh, the law, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the licensing of the groundwater and spring water and and pointed out. Uh, the, that there's a, a lack of, of that around desalination. And I uh, uh, would like to have uh, had uh, another stakeholder perspective. Like, I, you know, I can imagine with this, the environmentalists are going to be all over regulations around something like this, and maybe some uh, information about uh, what types of regulations, laws, et cetera, that environmentalist nonprofits would would like to see around uh, uh, something like this. Um, the financials, uh, you mentioned that there's only 8% of the revenue for Nestle, which uh, seems uh, you know, relatively uh, small in terms of the big picture of their 360 billion um, revenues per year. But I, I would like to have seen uh, what 
how is the desalination going to impact that 8%? Is it going to increase that? And if so, you know, how much or, or is it going to reduce that? So that would have been helpful to see if they're looking at expanding the uh, percentage of revenue through these desalination pro, uh, plants as a member of the board of directors for, for Nestle. Um, and uh, that's it. I mean, the, the presentation, it flowed extremely well. All of you spoke very clearly. And again, the slides and, and how you presented the information in the slides were extremely helpful. So I appreciate everything. Thank you. Great, thank you, Valerie. All right, so um, yeah, I'll start by saying a very impressive presentation. I thought you guys did a really great job um, from the, you knew the, the subject matter so well. The, as I said, the presentation flowed really nicely. And I also wanna talk about um, how you handle the Q&A portion, because we've been talking about this in some of my earlier sessions today about how oftentimes, you know, in my opinion, and I think in, in a lot of others, the hardest part of a presentation can be the, the questions and responding to the questions, because you just don't know what is going to be asked. And you kind of have to be really good at thinking on your feet, having the answer and, 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 and going from there. So I think you guys did a really great job with your answers. One thing I will caution you about, because there's, I know at least one judge of the, on the competition who's very sensitive about um, crisp answers. And, and there were a couple of times that several of you kind of chimed in with more information, really helpful information. So I wanna balance my feedback here by saying, you really wanna think about, do I really need to chime in or are we gonna let that answer sit? So just think about that a little bit. And I'm giving you guys such little tweaks here because you guys did so well. So I'm gonna just warn you, my things are gonna be pretty small. So just something to think about. Um, I guess one overall thing I would, I would think about is, you know, we were supposed to be the judges and I, right? We were supposed to be the board of directors of Nestle. And I felt like sometimes you guys forgot who you were talking to. And I say that because for one thing, I think you often refer to Nestle as they. And you might think about using the word you because you're talking to the, you're talking to Nestle, right? You're not talking to a third party. And I, I think that that plays through a little bit in, um, you know, let's, let's remember to be, that, that we're trying to convince a company and not make them defensive. And so an example of that, and I have to, I had to chuckle, um, Danielle, with your answer to my question about, well, Nestle's already overstepping, which is totally fair. But if I'm the Nestle board of directors and you just said that to me, what do you think my reaction is going to be, right? So I would just think about, um, you know, it, it's, it's, how do we sell this to them, but not totally trash them and, and say, you guys are doing horrible. So just something to think about is if you can keep that visual of, I'm talking to Nestle, how can I you know, make this argument? Um, I agree with um, the comment about Rohan, if you could clarify the slide on, on the cost of the, the adoption plan. So, you know, I see you had one bullet in there that said it was a short-term adoption, but I wasn't really clear on if we could get a little bit more nuance on what is the recommendation to, to kind of get us started. So something to think about there. Um, uh, Jack, um, I really appreciated when you started your section with kind of the realistic acknowledgement of Nestle's a for-profit company and why should they care? I thought that was a really great acknowledgement of the reality and then explaining the why. So really thought that was great. Sorry, I have all these little, again, these are like little things because overall it was such a great presentation. Um, last thing, just the charts were great. There was one of the, um, the graphs on slide 11 was too small for me to read. And I was like, it was the, um, there were two, it was the one above. I, I was like, couldn't, like it was just fuzzy and small. So maybe just look at that one and, and think if there's a way to, to kind of make it easier to read. Um, that's all of my, my comments. Um, again, you guys did a wonderful job. These are just little, little things that I, 
I, I thought you guys might, you know, think about um, for for tomorrow. Um,